Since World War II, the quality and quantity of democracies has increased, with 60% of countries being considered democratic. However, there is one notable outlier to this trend, China. The People's Republic of China is one of the few countries which runs on a communist government operating system. To understand this political system, we will look at an overview of the Chinese communist structure along with its functions and relation to the economy. The economy, however, will not be the main emphasis, but rather a brief summary will be given. The political system of China is a one-party state. This means the Communist Party of China, or CPC, exercises power in all major state functions, such as defense, government bodies, and the economy. More specifically, they use the nomenclatura system, also used in the Soviet Union. This is a system of appointment in which party committees are responsible for the motion and transfer of party, state, and public personnel and officials. Similar to other countries, China has a conventional architecture and organizations of a state, such as a constitution, congress, judiciary, press, and military. However, in this case, the CPC indirectly controls these bodies through organization parallelism. This translates to the party having a committee that replicates the corresponding functionality of a particular state entity. You can think of this as the user interface of an application in which the general layout is similar to other countries. However, the back end of the application where the business logic exists is where the party performs the important tasks of the state. The members and committees of the party then direct the policy process to the official state institutions in which most party members will usually hold a corresponding government position. The highest authority is the Politburo Standing Committee, which currently has seven members and the highest place of office is the General Secretary. As seen in the visuals, the National People's Congress is an equivalent to the National Party Congress, and such functions are replicated at all levels of the state. The reach of the CPC is relatively extensive. This is evident when looking at the HR department of the Communist Party creatively titled the Central Organization Department. As described in Richard McGregor's book, The Party, this organization oversees the United States equivalent of the entire U.S. cabinet, state governors and their deputies, the mayors of major cities, the heads of all federal regulatory agencies, the chief executives of GE, ExxonMobil, Walmart, and about 50 of the remaining largest U.S. companies, the justices on the Supreme Court, the editors of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, the bosses of the TV networks and cable stations, the presidents of Yale and Harvard and other big universities, and the heads of think tanks like the Brookings Institute and Heritage Foundation. To have an idea on the scope, it is estimated the party directly controls around 5,000 government positions and indirectly manages around 10 million positions in the party as well as the public sector. The department also keeps files on party officials such as job performance, political reliability, as well as checking for any misconduct such as crimes or sexual misdemeanors. The manner in which an official is chosen and appointed is through the party's more than 70 articles for promotion, which read like legislation. As noted in the book, promotions are tied to length of service, education levels, mandatory classes at party schools, economic growth, water and air quality, and public order. The system in practice, however, is not always clear-cut, as candidates deemed exceptionally talented can be promoted regardless of seniority, and certain metrics such as economic growth are more valued than others. It all depends on whether you get noticed at the end of the day. Studies looking at the promotion of officials find that those which performed well, as measured through GDP growth, were more likely to be promoted. However, if the official is additionally well-connected, which is if the official being promoted was a former colleague with one of the members of the current Politburo, or PSC, then this loyalty variable can help increase the likelihood of promotion 
even further, meaning loyalty does not replace merit, but rather interacts and complements it. Another study which looked at officials at the county, municipal, and provincial levels found that economic performance had a larger impact on promotion among lower level officials. The higher the post, the more promotion is less strictly tied to performance in office. This political selection system is not a new invention. China is regarded as one of the first civilizations to develop the civil service system and can be traced back to the Western Han Dynasty and Sui Dynasty with the imperial examination system. The Communist Party and its central organization department is in part a continuation of these systems. Back in the dynasty era, the selection process was not perfect, with only rich aristocrats having access and the resources necessary to compete in such examinations. The current selection process, like those in the past dynasties, also has weak points. The issue of corruption expresses itself at the local level in which party secretaries and the heads of the organization department run the grassroots administration like a franchise, selling government jobs for vast sums of money. The party accordingly tries to tweak and adjust the system to mitigate corruption. One such example is through stress testing promising officials and rotating them through various jobs in different parts throughout the country before sending them to Beijing, the political capital. There is a contradiction in this system like many political systems. On the one hand, the party tries to professionalize the selection of officials, but on the other hand, it undermines this effort by fixing appointments with loyalists. Additionally, there is a potential issue of a lack of checks and balances in this system, in which the PSC, the Politburo Standing Committee, has few other authorities to counter its power. Moving on to the economy, the strategy of the party towards the economy has generally followed the advice of the former party leader Deng Xiaoping, which is to pursue free market reforms but at the same time tighten the political authority. A phrase that embodies this idea is, grasp the big, let go of the small. In practice, this meant decentralizing economic decisions to the free market, but at the same time, retaining the ability to promote or demote personnel in boards of executives to maintain political control. In the public sector, this translates to the party supervising key economic sectors such as energy, steel, telecommunications, and transport. The control is exercised, as mentioned previously, through the ability to decide on personnel and by the government maintaining a large stake of equity in these public sector companies. In the private sector, this translated to fiscal decentralization, where prices and loans were decided and developed through private or public actors themselves, such as producers, banks, and local governments. The political economic reasons for why the Chinese decentralization of its economy succeeded can be explained in part by two factors. One factor is that the Chinese state retains a relatively high degree of autonomy. This refers to the ability of a state to act independently and not be influenced by outside interest groups. An opposite example of this is a government that is undermined by, say, a drug cartel or a powerful agglomeration of business groups and therefore not acting in the interest of society in general. As noted in the study, the political economy causes of China's economic success. In the first couple decades of the Communist Party rule, the party developed a relatively more egalitarian social class structure by removing the old class structures and in which the CPC became an encompassing organization. That is, its own interests significantly overlapped with the interests of society. Secondly, the party's meritocratic selection system helps mitigate a good degree of potential downsides of economic decentralization. As noted in the study, decentralization motivates local governments and officials to take the initiative to develop the local economy, while a meritocratic promotion system overcomes the negative effects of decentralization, such as regionalism and corruption. Fiscal decentralization in part helped China develop its economy starting with its agricultural sector. 
and later on manufacturing. This was done through the various non-state organizations ranging from town and village enterprises, also known as TVEs, which were collectively owned, as well as through individually owned enterprises and foreign funded companies. Many of these non-state companies were collectively owned, and the land they operated on was owned by the government, but they also operated on a for-profit basis and could dictate their own market prices for goods. The local governments helped many of these non-state enterprises by providing them with production materials, loans, and sales channels. Along with strong government autonomy, the merit-based promotion methods of the party and government helped mitigate a good degree of negative effects like corruption, leading to extremely high levels of growth. This is evident when looking at the revenues of non-state enterprises which started to outgrow the state-owned companies. To still maintain political control, the party borrowed elements of the federal system in the United States, in which, quote, it classified taxes into central, local, and shared taxes, and established the value-added tax at a uniform 17%, of which the central government took 75%, while local governments took 25%. This helped achieve fiscal decentralization, but also bolster the authority of the central government, which translates to the authority of the party. Overall, the party has achieved the goal of tightening political authority, but allowing flexibility of the economy. In a future instance, the economy could be examined more closely but for now, hopefully this provided a decent overview. The political system of China is an interesting exception when it comes to political organization, and partly because of this, a potential source of controversy. Regardless of one's opinion about this system, it is important to understand the internal mechanics and incentives at play. Without such examination and understanding, one's ability to act and judge become impaired and diminished. If interested in a much more detailed analysis, the book The Party by Richard McGregor is highly recommended and provides key insights into the Chinese political system.